The Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3 XL have been a very frustrating, annoying experience. In fact, some full-on disclaimers I'm just gonna throw out there before this video begins. If you're looking for a fair, honest, and decent review of a product where I go into the negatives, the positives, what you get out of this phone, what you don't get out of this phone, you're not going to find it here today. I've been using the Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3 XL as my daily drivers, as the phone in my pocket with my SIM card for the past 30 days now. Participated in this challenge, a lot of people said I couldn't do it. It was not easy, I'm gonna tell you. Yes, am I overdramatizing things? Absolutely, because if I didn't, the tech genre would be incredibly boring if I just told all of you, it's fine, you can get it if you want it. But instead of that, I'm a tech YouTuber that's going to take into consideration all of the other channels you've been watching. I'm taking into consideration the fact that you've had plenty of other YouTubers tell you that it's fine, there's ways of fixing it, it's my go-to choice. I like the Pixel 3, I like the Pixel 3 XL for doing this, that, and the other thing. If you want a YouTuber to tell you what is good about this phone, you can go ahead and find that somewhere else because I'm not gonna do it. This phone has been an absolute train wreck for me in regards to all of the phones I've ever tested. Android, iOS, in fact, most of the complaints I have about the Pixel 3 and the 3XL today, I'm not saying can be fixed by going over to Apple. I'm not even saying that iOS is the solution to all of the problems I have with this phone. I'm simply stating that other Android phones have figured out how to make a more decent experience, how to make a more quality product, Product, compared to Google, who designed Android and is now designing their own hardware, they don't got it. The way Android was meant to be used, this isn't it, okay? This is not the way Android is meant to be used, and I've used Android on lots of different devices, and I can confidently say that I've had a much better experience basically on any other product in the past that has run Android that is not this phone. So this is not even an Apple versus Google argument. I want to get that out of the way from the get-go. I'm sure that a lot of the things I'm going to complain about in today's video, you're going to comment, well, Drew, if you download this app, you can fix that. Or Drew, if you download this thing, you can fix it. If you go into these settings, you can actually toggle that off and you can fix these problems. You can explain that all you want, but honestly, I don't care because all of these fixes, all of these patches, all of these third-party apps you guys are going to download to try to fix your experience here will still never compete to what I can get on my iPhone. So let's extinguish that argument from the start. This thing can't pair with an Apple Watch. This thing doesn't have AirDrop. This thing can't do 4K at 60. This thing doesn't have an iMessage competitor that's anywhere near as good as iMessage or as implemented or anything that has near as good as the ecosystem as the iPhone does, but that's not what today's video is about. Today's just about what this phone is capable of, the hypocrisy of it, the complicatedness of it. So, without further ado, here is my rant. Very unfair, not nice, not optimistic, very pessimistic, absolutely nitpicking, incredibly first world problem review slash rant of the Pixel 3 in the Pixel 3 XL. So the first thing we should talk about with the Pixel 3 is the design. And for me, it is very, very hypocritical. This is one of the most asymmetrical phones I think I've ever used. So for one, you have the chin at the bottom, which even if you find a way to turn the notch off, which we'll get into later, the forehead, the deepness of the notch of the phone is bigger than that of the chin, which means that even with the notch off, the top of the phone is thicker than the bottom. So it's not symmetrical in that way. When you use the default mode and you don't activate developer options, the top of the phone has more curved corners than the bottom, which is a very bothersome design choice that they decided the bottom of the phone has to be curved this much, and then the top of the phone has to be curved more so. I don't know why, but it's just asymmetrical. When you're watching content, it's very asymmetrical because you'll have the top of the phone, which is a lot slimmer than the chin of the phone, which is funny because the notch is thicker than the chin, which means they could very, very easily, you know, Google, they designed the YouTube app, they could very easily center the video in the middle of the phone, yet they don't do that. I don't know why. The design choice of having the power and volume right next to each other. I don't know what people enjoy about this. Maybe it's the fact that they can control the volume and the power with one hand, but it really only works if you're holding it in your right hand, which is funny because for a lot of situations, if you're expecting everyone to hold it in their right hand, then screenshotting becomes a lot more difficult. We've had a huge Twitter debate about this. The fact that when you take screenshots on Android, most people, and on a lot of other Android phones, this makes complete sense, have the power and the volume on separate sides of the phone. That way, whether you're holding it in your right hand, like 
like this or your left hand like this, you can very easily hold on both sides of the phone. You can hold the bottom volume and power to take a screenshot, whether it's in your left or right hand, no problem. With this, if you're holding it in your right hand where it's very easy to navigate the buttons on the side, uh, now taking a screenshot becomes much more difficult. You either have to get your other hand and hold volume and power like this, or you have to hold power and then click the screenshot option, which takes much longer. Also not to mention, this is the first phone I've ever used that needs time to process the screenshot it actually just took. The Snapdragon CPU is so slower in the Pixel 3 compared to other Androids out there that the screenshot is not readily available in your notification center. Meaning that because they don't have an adequate cooling system or because they don't optimize their hardware at all, when you try to take a screenshot in this thing, it has to think about it and process it. For the past few years, I've been using iPhones and Androids that have always had screenshots like that. It's just taking a photograph of the display. It's really not that difficult and I've never had a phone that had to process and render out the screenshot. And this is the first time I've ever had this problem and it's sad that it's happening in the last couple months of 2018. The speaker on the bottom is obviously larger and louder than the top speaker, so that's not symmetrical. They have a SIM card on the bottom of the phone next to the USB-C port, so that bottom half isn't symmetrical. Not saying that iPhones are perfectly symmetrical either, I get that complaint. I'm just saying in terms of design, everything about this UI seems clunky. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Android 9 and gesture controls, which I think are also a complete train wreck. For one, in most apps you use, especially anytime you bring up the keyboard, they end up blacking out the bottom part of the phone and they don't even curve the corners, which I thought was the whole point of the display. Whenever you're using it now, the corners of the screen are curved in, but now in any app, most apps out there, I wouldn't say any app, but anytime you bring up the keyboard, they end up blacking out the bottom of the phone so that you can not have that curved corner anymore, have a thicker chin than you previously had, maybe to remind you of the OG Pixel days where the chins were enormous. They bring back the enormous chin using the user interface, but then the home button and the back button, for one, they're not of the same UI. The home button is really thick and very prominent, and then the return button, the back button is very thin, very small, and I feel like they don't go together. I feel like they updated the home button for Android 9, and then the back button, they were like, yeah, let's just leave that the way it is. But then you notice in most apps, they don't have a multitasking button anymore because they want you to do gesture control. But if you're doing gesture controls, why do you black out a bottom portion of the display no matter what app you're using and still have buttons? How is it gesture control if you're still keeping around buttons? It's also the gestures themselves not as intuitive as I've seen it done on other smartphones out there. Yes, the iPhone, but also Samsung knows how to do this better anyway. So instead of swiping up to go home like you would on an iPhone, swiping up starts to launch the app launcher, but then instead activates multitasking in the most iOS-like clone I've ever seen. Now, it's okay if they want to copy iOS because I think iOS is actually good, so I'm fine with that. But the fact that you start to open the app drawer and then it goes to multitasking feels incredibly clunky. It doesn't feel natural. And also, when you swipe your finger across the bottom of the display, you kind of are able to swipe between all the apps you have open, but you have to hold your thumb there. Instead of just swipe back and forth between apps you have open, now you have to swipe and hold and it will slide between the apps you have open slowly and then you have to just wait until this you know wheel basically is scrolling and stops on your app and then release at the exact right time so that hopefully you launch that app correctly which is just stupid it's really really clunky i know there's a way you can turn it off but to me it's just a very very blatant way of google trying to do what apple did with the iphone 10 and them very much failing at it because they knew they couldn't do exactly what apple did so they had to mix it up a little bit and in regards of mixing it up a little bit they made it just horrible and clunky. If you're gonna have buttons, do buttons. If you're gonna have gestures, do gestures. But don't do this weird hybrid of, well, you gesture to get multitasking, but there's still a home button when you wanna go home. Because then, in every app, you have this giant empty space at the bottom of the phone that doesn't use anything. There's never a button there, yet they keep acting like there's supposed to be a button there, but in order to activate multitasking, you still gotta swipe up to do gestures. So again, just a hypocritical design that doesn't really feel thought out, doesn't really feel intuitive, and based on a lot of the complaints I've heard from other Android users, not everyone's a huge fan of these gestures either, and most people end up turning them off. Once again, fixing the phone to make it work better. This user interface is also not friendly when you're watching content in landscape mode. Not only is it asymmetrical, but at least on Samsung phones, they've designed it so that if you press hard, no matter what app you're using, no matter if it's in landscape or portrait mode, if you press hard where the home button used to be, you'll get taptic feedback and it will take you directly home. Whereas on the iPhone, you know, you have gesture controls, so even if you're watching in landscape mode, you just swipe up and you
you go home, just like in any other app. In this though, if you're watching in YouTube, there's no any of those solutions. You have to swipe to the side, bring up the home button, then tap it. So it's this combination of gestures and buttons being put together, which at the end of the day still to me feels incredibly clunky. And while this may seem like a lot of you are just like, well, this is just nitpicking, Drew. These are just tiny things. These are things that add up, okay? When you're doing this all throughout the day and you realize, oh yeah, I gotta swipe up and then hit the button and you try to activate multitasking and then you're in the app drawer and it's like, okay, I wanted the app drawer. So now anytime I access the app drawer, it has to activate multitasking at the same time. To which I respond, you know, I think gestures are better. I think when you're gonna make a bezel type design and you wanna have as much display as possible, gestures are in favor of that because gestures don't have to take up space on the screen. They allow you to navigate the phone, but they don't have to be dedicated buttons. So I like gestures, but honestly, if this is your idea of gestures, I would rather go back to the buttons. They should have just stuck with those and stop expecting people to just adapt to this clunky way of doing it. So not a fan of Android 9 gesture controls. It just feels like Google's desperate attempt of, eh, we, we can be like Apple too, right? Another thing that bothers me about Android is that there's no volume changers on the display itself. Now, I know there's customizations you can make in the settings, but it bothers me that in situations like the phone's charging on the Pixel stand, and I'm just using like my right hand to change the volume really quickly, I can't just swipe down into the settings and control volume. Even in the edit toggle, there's no volume changing title that I can add to my settings. I'm sure there's some app I can download, but what I like about iOS is the fact that I can just quickly go to control center, change the volume, and then be done. Or even in our music apps, whether it be Apple Music or whether you use Google Play Music, it's very easy to just change the volume slider right on your iPhone. Whereas with Google's apps, there's no like easy volume control. Not to mention when you're on your lock screen, on iPhones, when you have music playing on your lock screen, you can change it when the phone is locked and you can scrub through your music with the playhead again as the phone is locked. Whereas this, when the phone is locked and you're playing music, basically all you can do is pause it, fast forward and rewind with the display. If you wanna change the volume otherwise, you have to go to the buttons, which mean basically, hey, I gotta pick up this phone. Whereas before on my iPhone, I could just have it charging, I could have it mounted on a stand or whatever, and I can very easily just change it with one finger, not have to pick up the entire phone and then change it that way. It just feels less intuitive, and I thought Android was about options. Not to mention iOS has their own built-in screen recorder. Android still doesn't. You have to go download another one. It's not native. And once again, I just feel like a missed opportunity, something that could very easily be fixed that they haven't fixed. Now, in regards to the ugly notch, I think the Pixel 3 XL could have looked incredibly cool in 2016 when notches were not a regular thing yet. We would have been like, okay, this is kind of weird. This is kind of bizarre, but they're trying to make the display more bezel -less and they got a pretty high screen to body ratio. So I get it. But the fact that there have been multiple other notches released since this one that have looked way more clean, way less intrusive and way better at optimizing them for the software, this one has no exception. The iPhone 10 came out a year before this thing and had a much less intrusive, much more optimized notch. In fact, most of the time, apps don't know how to handle the notch on Android. See, on iOS at least, they've done a pretty good job kind of embracing the notch, getting out of the way and not being too, I don't know, clunky about it. That's the only way I can think of describing it. But in most apps, when you open them, the notch is kind of considered not really there. They just kind of gray it out and consider it top bezel and say, ah, just change that part of the phone to a different color, I guess. They don't really embrace it in most of the apps. Most of the time, they just put a line to where the notch ends and the user interface and say, okay, don't let these things touch each other. So probably because of the distortionness of Android, and there's so many different Android apps out there that the developers on the Play Store have to optimize their app for all these different phones, they're probably seeing the pixel and going, eh, we're not going to take time to do that. So most apps either, again, just kind of gray it out, change it to a different color, which kind of ruins the whole beauty of this design trying to have curved corners and bezel -less look. If anytime you open the keyboard, they black out the bottom and delete your curved corners and make the chin bigger. And then on the top, they just kind of gray it out. They don't turn it completely black. They just gray it out and turn it into some weird random color. And it doesn't flow well with the user interface. It doesn't feel seamless. It feels like a prototype. And honestly, I'm amazed that the Pixel 3 XL in that notch got past the drawing board. Someone should have looked at this and said, okay, no, we're not going to do that. That doesn't look good. Let's try to think of something more intuitive and more clean. This should have been in a prototype laboratory of, well, if we decide to have an ultra wide lens, here's what the notch will look like. And then the guy in charge of design would have looked at it and gone, <laughs> no, we're not doing that. That looks weird. So at the end of the day, notch is just not a thought out experience. Then we had the regular Pixel 3 charging issue. So this has not been a problem on the 3XL. I can confidently say the full size Pixel 3XL at $900 did not have a terrible battery 
battery. It had a fine time charging. I didn't have overheating issues with this phone. So if you're spending 900 bucks, you should be good. But if you try to get the cheaper option without the notch, you're going to have some battery problems. For one, the Pixel 3 battery did not last me through the day at all. It usually died way before the end of the day. And also when it came to charging it on the Pixel stand, I did a whole video on this. It had overheating issues where just playing YouTube audio would make the phone get so incredibly hot that it couldn't stay on. It had to shut itself off. It charged slowly. So if the display was on and it was on the Pixel stand, it would not gain a percentage. It would still go down even though it is fast wirelessly charging. So the battery and the heating issues on the Pixel 3 are really, really bad to the point that while the notch is really hideous on the 3XL, I would rather have this phone than the regular 3. Believe me, I had the option to go back to the smaller Pixel 3 if I wanted to. At any time, I still had that phone and I consciously chose to stay with the 3XL because while this has its own set of problems, at least the battery life got me through the day and the regular Pixel 3, an $800 phone, could not even hold the charge, could not even stay on without charging, could not even stay on when it was charging and playing YouTube audio. The display was not even on. Just playing audio in the background and charging at the same time overheated the phone and made it crash. And in that video, you can see that this actually was not just an isolated instance. This happened to lots of different YouTubers and users out there. And this was a reported known issue. In regards to quality control being a problem, you notice that I haven't talked a lot about the issues I've had that I've not seen reported very often. But when using the Pixel 3 XL, Chrome crashed quite constantly. I did screenshot it every time it happened. So just browsing the internet, I was having lunch with my sister and we were talking about Toy Story 4 coming out. And we were kind of like, why are they making it? So I go online to search like the trailer or the poster. So I go on Google Chrome and search Toy Story 4, crashes. I'm like, that's kind of weird. Reopen Chrome, crashes again. And I go, okay, that's really bizarre. So I close all my other apps I have open just in case this is some type of major RAM management issue. But I open Chrome a third time, try to search Toy Story 4, and again, the phone crashes. I had to borrow my sister's iPhone 6, not even a 6 Plus, not even a 6S, a regular iPhone 6 to look up pictures on the internet. This is made by Google. The phone, the hardware is made by Google. The operating system is made by Google. The browser, the search engine is all made by Google. They have complete control over every aspect of this user interface that I was using and the app crashed six to seven times in a row and still happens every day when I use this phone randomly. I'll be using Chrome, sometimes it works fine and then it'll just randomly crash. Don't really have an explanation for it, it just does. And I just think it's ridiculous that Google controls every aspect of this experience and yet they still can't get it to work right. Chrome isn't responding, Chrome isn't responding and you just gotta close the app again. And I've never ever in all of the smartphones I've ever tested in my life had this problem before. On no iPhone, on no LG, on no Android I've ever used has Chrome crashed as often as it has on the Pixel 3 XL. Now I'm sure there's people out there saying, Drew, you must be cursed because I've never had that problem on my 3 XL. That's good. I'm happy for you. I really do enjoy the idea that you guys like this phone because I have nothing to gain from you guys having a negative experience. All I'm doing today is telling you mine so that hopefully people out there debating getting this phone can at least be warned of my experience and understand, okay, if I buy this phone, here's some of the things that might happen. I also think that the front facing speakers do not justify this design. The idea of the very big chin at the bottom compared to other phones that are coming out right now, this chin is quite large. And the very deep notch cutting into the content, very intrusive, just so that you can have front facing speakers. They don't sound excellent. I've used front facing speakers like on the Razer phone too. Those sound excellent and they blow away the competition. While stereo speakers, I agree, are nice. They definitely don't make or break the phone. But if you have to make these types of design compromises just so that you can have front facing speakers, to me, it's not worth it. They did not sound miles better than an iPhone. In fact, they sounded pretty average compared to the iPhone 10 I was using before. And if anything, I noticed that the iPhone 10 was actually quite a bit louder. It may not be directed at me, but if you just get your regular iPhone 10, probably a lot of you watching this video on it, and you turn up the volume all the way and you hold the back end of the speakers directly at you versus in front of you, the sound is not drastically different. It may seem a little bit more immersive to have the speakers pointed straight at your face, but honestly, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So front facing speakers, it's cool, but if you're gonna make the phone look this bad, don't bother, just put the speakers on the bottom. I think people will get over it. At best, these speakers were on par with the iPhones. At worst, they were probably a little bit quieter. I don't agree with YouTubers that say they were more clear. I've used both extensively and they sounded very, very similar, except the iPhone 10 has a much more aesthetically pleasing way of handling it, as do the Samsung phones. Now this next thing you guys are probably just gonna tell me I'm a liar 
fire on. You're welcome to do that. I didn't really have evidence of this because I'm not a durability channel. I do not film phones breaking. So I don't have video or photographic evidence of this. But back when I was using my iPhone XS Max, I was laying down on my bed and the phone fell out of my pocket and onto the floor. We have a tile floor at our house. And I was really, really worried because this is like a two and a half, maybe three foot drop. Our bed's kind of high off the ground. It's not low to the ground. And I laid down, phone fell out of my pocket onto hard tile, no case on it. And I was like, oh no, I just shattered my brand new iPhone. This sucks. I didn't even get Apple Care. So really worriedly, I turn on the lights. I pick up my XS Max and go, oh, uh, Actually, it's it's fine. There may be like tiny, tiny, really hard to see scuffs on the stainless steel, but for the most part, it looked completely fine. I think the 10s Max handled durability no problem. Maybe the stainless steel handled most of the blow. The glass did not scratch. The glass looked completely fine. I also don't even have a screen protector on my 10s Max, but don't worry. After that drop, I did get a case for it just in preparation for if that ever happened again. But yeah, all I'm trying to say is I don't drop phones often. That was a very incredibly rare instance for me, dropping my iPhone on tile from two and a half to three feet. Absolutely no problem. But when I switched over to the Pixel 3 XL and I laid down on my bed, I realized, oh wait, this isn't technically my phone yet. You know, like Aaron from For the Love of Tech has bought me this phone, but if I fail the challenge, I have to give it back. I don't want to break this phone. So I took it out of my pocket. And just when I was laying down on my bed, I rested the phone like this on the tile. I didn't drop it. It was not a chuck across the room. All I did was rest it on the tile very, very gently because I was just laying down for the day. I was very, very tired. I didn't want to get up and find some charger to plug it in on. I was just like, oh crap, don't let this phone drop on the floor. So I just pulled it out of my pocket, rested it on the floor and said, okay, it's fine. Didn't drop it, didn't crack it, we're good. Later to find out after a few hours of napping, I got up, pulled out the Pixel 3 XL off the floor and there were scratches all over the display. Very, very visible scratches to the glass that everyone I've shown this phone to can see. Now, all I'm trying to say is whatever glass they use on the 10s Max, at least in my experience, of course, this could be completely situational. Maybe some of you have dropped your 10s Max Max one foot and it shattered versus your 3XL and it didn't shatter after six feet. I know glass breaking is very, very individualistic, which is why I find drop tests so stupid because it depends on the situation, how the phone landed, what angle it landed on, the speed, the material it landed on. So I'm not trying to detriment this. All I'm saying that in my experience, the glass on the 10S Max is far superior, far more durable. And I assume it's the same glass they use on the 10R, the 10S, way more durable on those phones than it is on this because I just lightly, lightly rested it on a top floor and it had scratches all over it just from that one time. Never dropped this phone in any other instance. It's never fallen on tile. It's never fallen on concrete. And yet the scratches are very noticeable. So at least in my experience, the glass on this phone is not the best in durability. In regards to the glass on the back, the matte finish to me feels cheap. It turns a glass feeling phone, which to me feels very premium, into a plastic feel. It feels like it's made of cheap plastic. It looks like a toy. And of course, we've had all of the scratch issues like Marquez had his scratch up over time. Time. It's much harder to see on the Pixel 3 XL, not pink version, but when you hold it under certain light, you can definitely see the scratches developing over time because of that matte finish on the back that these scratches I would normally see on something like an iPhone 6 with an aluminum back, I'm seeing on glass, which normally I don't have this problem on glass backed phones because glass doesn't scratch this way, but Google insists on having their matte slash glossy finish. And because of that, people are experiencing really, really scratchy, really hard to remove marks on the back of their phone. Yes, I understand. But you can wash it off with a cloth every single day in a toothbrush and dish soap. You shouldn't have to do that with the phone. That does not excuse the design trend. That also does not excuse the iPhone 7 jet black version, which I understand was very scratched up. I had one myself, but at least Apple put a disclaimer on the release of that phone. When you bought the jet black iPhone 7, they said, you really want to use a case with this. The aluminum is not very durable. It will scratch very easily. So they warned us. Also on launch day, jet black was very hard to get a hold of anyway. There were way more colors available in the regular aluminum versions. And also Apple's moved away from aluminum backs anyway. They're going all in on glass backs and glass backs don't have this problem. Even though Google has a glass back on the Pixel 3, they kept around the aluminum scratching problem that develops over time and is very hard to get rid of. Just because they want their signature design trend, it's gotta look like a Pixel phone. Even if that means sacrificing on the aesthetic of the phone in the long run, it has to have that matte finish black. In regards to biometrics on the Pixel 3, there is only the fingerprint reader, no face unlock of any kind, which is funny 
money given that Apple's got their face ID, Samsung had their iris scanning, OnePlus has their super fast face unlock. That's not the most secure method out there, but they have face unlock for people who want it. Not to mention OnePlus also has built-in fingerprint readers into the display for $550. With this $900 hunk of joy, you get a rear-facing fingerprint reader, just like old times, nothing fancy. They didn't even try to put face unlock. I thought maybe they got two cameras on the front. Maybe the two cameras can help make some type of secure face unlocking technique that makes the phone unlock really securely and quickly. But nah, we don't want to do that. Let's just let's just do the old-fashioned fingerprint reader on the back while still having a big chin. Maybe they could have put a fingerprint reader on the front. I don't know. Putting it underneath the display seems to be possible. So I don't know why they couldn't do that. But yeah, they didn't really try very hard in the biometric stage. Not to mention on the smaller Pixel 3 when using a Pixel stand. So mind you, this is like a $900 charging experience. You can't reach the fingerprint reader because the charge stand covers it. So if you want to be able to unlock your phone without picking it up off of the Pixel stand, you got to spend $1,000 and get the $900 version and then $80 on the Pixel stand just so you can unlock it while it's charging. Whereas on any iPhone 10 with Face ID, you can just tap on the display and it unlocks because it's pointed directly at you. And Face ID is pretty reliable now. It's getting a lot better and I'm sure it'll get even better in 2019, but Google clearly doesn't care. They're just like, yeah, fingerprint reader, let's just leave it at that. Why try, you know? Let's just charge premium prices and not do anything. Also in regards to quality control, I got OLED burn-in on this model after two days of use. Yeah, I unboxed it brand new, turned it on, and after two days, now this is very hard to get visualized on camera, but I do want to assure you in person, it is much more noticeable. I've handed this to lots of different people. My cousins who are Android fans and Randy Vasquez who came up for my wedding, I, we all looked at it and can confirm this is definitely burn-in. This is a line in the display that is not supposed to be there. We did our best to take a picture of it. We have to change the lighting a little bit for it to show up, but because of the Pixel 3's bright display, it's kind of hard to get it to show up. But if you held it in person, I can confirm it's absolutely burn-in and it happened really, really fast. I never had any OLED burn-in on any other OLED display in my life. No Samsung phone had it, no iPhone with OLED had it, and I used them for prolonged periods of time with the display on for long periods of time, and I've never had burn-in until this phone, which I've barely owned for a month. I also think it's ridiculous that Google relies so heavily on your Wi-Fi for storage. You know, they have $800, $900 phones, but no 256 gig option because they're just like, nah, we're sure you have good Wi-Fi. We'll rely on you for good Wi-Fi. We can just back up all of your files and all of your pictures and videos. We're sure you have great upload speeds, which if you do, I guess it works. I'm in favor of cloud storage, but there's plenty of people out there that don't want everything instantly being backed up because that affects their upload speed and can affect their livelihood. Or maybe they just don't have great upload speed. So now whenever their phone comes on, it's going to mess with their Wi-Fi as it did for us. We do a lot of live streaming at the Telos of Office. And every time I would take long videos or take pictures with this thing, it would start to bog down our internet because this thing is constantly backing up pictures and videos in the background. Maybe that's what affected the Pixel 3's battery so heavily is that they just assumed it would have no problem constantly uploading in the background when in reality that hurt the battery a lot. Not to mention no expandable storage. You know, we're in a time now where iPhones and Galaxies, we're getting 5, 12 gigs of storage. There's even reports that the Galaxy S10 could have a terabyte of storage. Now, I think that's absolutely ridiculous, but to the market out there that cares about those higher storage options, it's kind of ridiculous to me that Google phones, the way Android's meant to be used, kind of max out at 128 gigs, which is kind of considered normal slash standard for a lot of phones out there. A lot of phones come with 128 gigs by default, and this has that as the maxed out version at $1,000 for 128 gigs, and you can't upgrade it down the line if you want to. Again, this design choice would make sense, them skimping out on good hardware and having less hardware than much more premiumly priced phones. It would all make sense if the Pixel was a much more affordable option. They would say, well, we can't afford to have those other storage options or those expandable storage because we want to keep prices low as possible. But they don't. This is an expensive phone where there shouldn't be much compromise. If people want options, they should have them, especially if they're buying into Google and Android. In spending 900 bucks, you should be getting a Samsung-like hardware experience. In return, you're getting a ultra-budget Xiaomi $400 experience for 900 bucks. Now, I've complained a lot about the notch today, and a lot of people, I'm sure, have said, Drew, you can turn off the notch and make the corners of the phone all the same roundedness. Well, let me tell you how easy it is to turn the notch off with Android in the settings app. So it's not something you can just find under display settings. On LG phones, you know, you can just go into settings and say, hey, turn the notch off. Or on Huawei phones, it's just open settings, go to notch and just turn it off. And then they put the clock and they put the data and the widgets up in the top corner. Well, they don't do that on the Pixel because, I mean, heck, they didn't even put reachability or one-handed mode.
iPods, something we've had on iPhones for years, something we've had on Galaxies for years. If you want to use it with one hand, you can. You can activate one-handed mode or you can activate reachability. With Google, they didn't do either of that. But in regards to turning off the notch, here's what you have to do. It's very simple, guys. Just go to settings. We're gonna scroll down to a system, then tap about phone, then scroll down to the build number, and then you're gonna tap it seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I'm a developer. Now go back to system and hit developer options and you have them turn on. Then keep scrolling, just keep scrolling. There's a lot of these here. Go all the way down to display cutout. Then under display cutout, you can do tall cutout. You can do double cutout or you can do corner cutout in which case they'll cut out the corner of the phone. Yay. And also don't tap anything on accident in developer settings. Otherwise this might happen. It's very easy to mess up stuff in developer settings. So really be careful of what you tap in there. But then yeah, after that the notch goes away. Very, very easy. Also you can have a double notch or a corner notch if you want. What are they thinking? thinking why on earth would anyone have a double notch not to even mention with the double notch the notch on the bottom is not even the same shape as the actual pixel 3xl notch so if you wanted more asymmetrical design there you go the 3xl could be even more asymmetrical you can have a chin and a off-centered weird looking notch that's different from the notch on the top of the phone yeah i don't i don't get it i i'm so so confused as to why Google thinks that someone would want two notches, but it's for developers, except everyone wants to turn this off, everyone. Now, of course, I've complained about this phone for a long time today, and I'm sure all of you are expecting me to talk about the camera. But Drew, the camera, Drew, Drew, the camera, the camera's good though, the camera's good, but the camera's decent, Drew, so it's okay. It's the best camera on a smartphone. No, it isn't, all right? Just stopping you right there. This is not the best camera on a smartphone. You cannot tell me that this is the best camera on a smartphone where they're literally removing video options. Cameras on our smartphones do a lot of things. They take pictures, they take panoramas, they take videos, and you can't throw out the complete performance of video and then say that this camera is the best in a smartphone. That's not true. I don't even think for stills this is the best camera in a smartphone. Yeah, I'll say it. I'll go there. You want me to go there? I've taken a lot of pictures with the Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3 XL and compared them to the iPhone 10R or the iPhone 10S. And you know what? It gets bokeh pretty good, but sometimes it'll mess up just like any other phone. I'm not saying, I'm not saying the 10S or the 10R are way ahead in terms of photography, but on Samsung phones and on iPhones, you can see the portrait shot in real time. You don't have to wait six seconds for the image to process. The bokeh on the 3 and the 3XL messes up a lot. It messes up here, it messes up there. It makes mistakes because our algorithms and our bokeh guessing technology has not been perfected. And thinking that it sucks on everyone else's phone, but it's great on the Pixel, I think is a huge misconception that a lot of YouTubers are sending out to audiences out there. That for some reason, the portrait mode on the 3 is just infinitely better than everyone else's, it isn't, okay? We've, we've experimented with Galaxies and iPhones. They do fine, okay? They can get portrait mode as good as it needs to be. Plus you can affect with depth, change the bokeh on iPhones and you can't do that with the Pixel. And it's instant on iPhones, whereas on Pixels you have to wait longer because it has to process the image. And in terms of video, they removed frame rate options. They don't let you choose what frame rate you record video at. On an iPhone, you can do 24, you can do 30, you can do 60. This has been an option for years. And yet Google with Android 9 was like, eh, let's remove that. We don't need the frame rate option. That's stupid. They've provided no reason or no logical explanation as to why they removed it. There was an option that now iPhones have that Androids don't. If you upgrade to Android 9, which is ridiculous to me. Night shot is cool though. Takes good shots in the dark. Yeah, I, don't, I got nothing there. That's just cool. I, I, I guess spend $900 on this piece of crap so that you can take good night mode shots. Other than that though, I had a pretty crappy experience. I can't wait to switch back to my iPhone now. I'm so grateful the challenge is over. A lot of you were participating participating in the Android challenge with me. The challenge is now over. Let's look forward to December. And thank you guys for sticking with me throughout this entire video. Yes, this took a while to make, but I appreciate you watching the whole thing. So without further ado, this is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, Pixel.